Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Kit Prendergast. I'm a native bee ecologist, and I've spent the past uh, four and a half years studying native bees. Before that, um, I did my honours on horse behaviour. So it was a bit of a, a change. I never thought I would be studying native bees, and I like the confession here. I thought I'd be studying vertebrates for my PhD. So, um, but now I'm completely in love with native bees, and um, they're such a passion for me. And they're not just my you know job; they've become like a lifestyle. And um, I'm really excited to be um, sharing with you my research today and I'm actually going to be talking to you about my thesis and this is the first time that I'm actually presenting my thesis as a whole to an audience um, so I'm actually like a bit a bit nervous because this is my baby right <laughs> um, and I've spent so long on it and uh, it's actually under it's still under examination I submitted it in August at the start of August and um, it was examined but then it had to be sent out again because Curtin made a mistake with selecting examiners. So that was a bit frustrating. Um, so some of the, the results here are um, not published, but I'll be telling you which ones are published um, so that everything is transparent about what is published and what isn't. So that's the title of my thesis, a bit of a mouthful. Urban native bee assemblages and the impact of the introduced European honeybees on plant pollinator networks in the Southwest Australian mm. biodiversity hotspot. Mm. And um, that's my ORCID code, and that basically has all my publications on it. And I've also got a research gate, so if anyone wants to read any of my publications, you can um, get in contact with me or um, go onto there. Oh, excuse me, Kit, yes. would you like the lights turned down? Is that um, too bright for you? Oh, it's fine for me. How is it yeah. for everyone else? Oh, um, mm -hmm. that, that, that's really good. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think they're the end ones. The close to the back. Ah, that's better. Yeah, better. Okay. So, um,. I collected so much data and I had so many ideas because that is the great thing about native bees. They're so diverse. There are so many ecological questions you can answer with studying native bees. And um, what I managed to put in my thesis was actually only a small part of what I studied. So I've still got about 10 other papers half finished and many more that I could still work on. So um, it was actually a really big thesis, uh, about 834 pages. Um, and you know, there's a, a limit on thesis as how big they can be as well. So I just just got under the, the limit. <laughs> um, so I had an introductory chapter, which was just talking about native bees and what I was focusing on, the key threats to native bees, which are habitat loss and urbanisation is a major cause of habitat loss, and introduced species, the European honeybee, which is um, I, I never realised how controversial why my thesis would end up being. Um, so um, I riled up a few few beekeepers over the years. Um, but it's something that needs to be addressed. So then um, my second chapter was a global review of the determinants of native bee assemblages in urban landscapes. Um, and I spent, I started working on this basically halfway through 2016 and I only submitted it um, to a journal. Um, urban ecosystems uh, about a week before I submitted my thesis, so I spent about four years working on this, um, and it's still under review, which um, mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a very big review, so I guess that's to be expected. Then I looked at the relative performance of sampling methods to survey bees. Um, that had been published in Ecosphere, um, and it's already got four citations. It was published in March this year, so I'm pretty happy about that. Mm -hmm. um, and then this chapter, this is the one that has given me the most grief because uh, it's still not submitted. Um, it was, it's actually a very neat paper. It's, I thought it would be the most simplest paper. I was just comparing bushland remnants to residential gardens, but the, the paper was quite easy to write, but um, there were a bit of co-author issues with that one. Um, so that, the thesis, the fieldwork um, was yeah, beautiful. I'm sure it was hard. 
but um, probably the hardest bit of the thesis was managing managing other people. Um, I guess that's <laughs> typical of life. And then um, chapter five, my um, plant pollinator networks in Australian urban bushland remnants. Um, so I need to update that because that has now been accepted. So it should be published any day in urban ecosystems. Um, chapter six has been accepted with revisions and are under review. Um, so hopefully that will be published soon. And that was the impact of honeybees and pollination networks. And then chapter seven, the impact of honeybees on native bees in urban areas. And that's also been accepted with revisions and then a summary. So I'll be getting into a bit more detail. So firstly, what are the major threats to wild bees? So we've got habitat loss and fragmentation, which leads to many other threats. So um, small population sizes, which in turn leads to um, potential for inbreeding, um, which increases declines and go into an extinction vortex. Um, reduced habitat diversity, which means there's um, reduced niches. So habitat loss and fragmentation cause all these interacting effects that um, in turn lead to reduced population sizes, extirpation of bees, and then you have just um, basically general speeds that are left, patches of bees that are no longer there, um, and then reduced pollination services. So habitat loss is a, a big, um, big threat to bees. Um, it leads to their um, loss of their preferred foraging and nesting resources. And urbanisation is a major cause of habitat loss, and it's becoming an increasing um, cause of habitat loss as uh, global populations of humans grow. Now, another threat to wild bees is competition with introduced species. And um, Apis mellifera, the European honeybee, <coughs> this is one of the um, most prolific introduced species in the world. Yet, you still hear in the media that. Honeybees are threatened, honeybees are declining, honeybees might go extinct. That is absolutely not true. Um, they are one of the most abundant um, species on the planet. They are on every continent except Antarctica. And um, they are super generalists. They can forage in a whole range of resources. Um, so these traits make them very good for being able to be put into agricultural areas to pollinate crops and um, also um, being landscapes are actually uh, very inhospitable for um, wildlife in general. Um, but they are very, they can be very good competitors. Um, so this, this species that is sort of the, the dominant species that people know about is actually, has a potential to negatively impact wild bees. So I first wanted to um, identify what are the, the features of urban areas that influence native bee assemblages. And I did a review and I read, um, it involved 225 studies, but I read a whole lot more um, for like background and theory. Um, so yeah, and I read all of these papers. So every single one of these I read. And I did a review I looked at um, of studies that have been conducted on bees in urban landscapes what was the mean number of sites they surveyed, what was the average duration, um, and um, one of the, the, the key things that I put out from you was lots of these studies are actually conducted um, for a very short time. Um, so the range of months they were conducted and, um, was um, less than a month to 17 months, but with a mean of two months. And the phenology of these, it changes drastically over um, you know, especially for example, if anyone goes out here in, in Southwest WA, um, you see different bee assemblages essentially every two weeks. So having studies that are conducted for just two months um, could be quite biased. Mm. Um, and the duration was, um, yeah, a, a median of one year. And there's actually like, with my study, I found different assemblages between years. And this is an issue, and it's due to the lack of, of funding in long-term studies. And you know, a PhD is only funded for three years. Um, so that that's a big issue, um, especially when we're looking at interacting threats like urbanization, climate change, or um, lags and extinction risk. 
So um, I looked at, of these studies, um, most of them were in bee communities as a whole. There are actually very few studies that looked at just a single species and how it responded to urbanisation. Um, and of the subset, um, lots were, like the majority were on bombus, so these are the bumblebees. Mm. Uh, sadly, we don't have any here. Oh, I guess, not sadly from a competition point of view, but sadly because I love bumblebees. But they're really cute and very amenable to study. Um, and two on the Melaphonini, so these are the, the stingless or sugar bag bees. Um, we don't have any here in southwest Western Australia. Three on Euglossini, now I would love to have these here. These are the um, orchid bees, and um, they, they are specialised on orchids, the males. They collect the, the scent from orchids, and they're um, metallic, so they're very beautiful. And then six studies on cavity nesters. And, um, I, I looked at Cabernet's just specifically in bee hotels. This is another paper that is um, in the works, mm. unfortunately. Didn't make it to the thesis. So um, of studies that have been conducted on um, bees in urban areas, there's a massive geographic bias. So most in the USA and Canada and also in Europe, you can see they absolutely dominate. And um, there's been a fair bit in um, uh, Brazil in particular. Now, Africa is you know, a major continent, only two studies, so this is a very under-researched area. In Australia, um, only 13, and most of these have been on the East Coast. And that's where um, most big research is, is conducted, unfortunately, on the East Coast. Um, so I looked at, um, there were studies that compared how bees responded to um, urban areas, agricultural areas, and natural landscapes. And this was really interesting in that um, the key thing to pull out here is that um, in terms of abundance, bees can actually um, do better in urban areas, but they, um, if you're comparing urban areas and agricultural areas, um, they definitely do better. Um, but then when we're looking at species richness, this is where the, the key thing comes out is that um, urban areas, they have fewer species. And um, so even if you do a study and you're just looking at numbers of bees rather than numbers of species, you can get a different picture on how bees are doing. Now, this is a, a very big complex diagram, so um, this is just here for like illustrative purposes, but what I did was I looked at the various variables that could influence bees in urban areas. Um, so numbers of flowers, number of flower species, proportion of native um, flowers, amount of ground cover, number of trees, habitat complexity, amount of green space in the, the landscape, the amount of built space in the landscape, um, landscape diversity, um, socioeconomic st status. Um, numbers across here show how many studies have looked at these variables. So lots have looked at flowers. Now interestingly, there's been hardly any studies on the effect of traffic on um, bees, so that, that's a, an area for, for future research for sure. Um, but the main thing here is that uh, generally more flowers and more flower species are good for the native bees, but um, the native flora is particularly important and when we're looking at the amount of built space in an area, um, that's generally negatively impacting native bees, um, as can be expected because um, bees can't nest in concrete and um, there's no flowering resources in, in concrete spaces either. Um, so that, um, this is the same thing but in terms of species richness and there was um, similar patterns here in terms of what influenced native bees but you can also see with both of these that there's you know um, lots of studies finding non-significant influences and also with almost every variable um, when there's not many studies, that's when there's only you know one response or two responses. But with almost every variable, um, there's mixed responses. So they might respond positively and negatively. So obviously there's still a lot to, to untangle and unpack in terms of what influences native bees in urban areas. Hmm. So now to my research. So um, for my thesis, I studied 14 sites in the Perth region. And half of these sites were bushland remnants and half of them were people's gardens. And um, that's a map of my study sites there. 
and I visited them uh, monthly from November to February in the first year, October to March in the second year. Um, in the first year I wanted to do it longer but I didn't get the permissions in time. So yeah, there's, there's all these other things that um, you have to factor in um, when you're doing surveys and um, doing study projects. So getting through like the bureaucracy and getting permissions um, can take a while. So I did three hour surveys per site and I counted how many bees I saw, so based on observations. I also um, used passive methods, collecting honey bees and native bees, and this involved um, bee bowls, which were blue and yellow souffle cups and yellow pans filled with water and surfacant to um, reduce uh, injuries to surface tension, and vein traps, which are basically yellow um, jars, I suppose, with two veins that are at cross angles. Um, I had yellow ones and blue ones, and these were checked monthly. And then I actively um, swept these off plants. And I also used bee hotels. And I used um, wooden blocks of jarra, and they were 12 centimetres long. And I used um, one millimetre, uh, no, 10 millimetre, seven millimetre, and four millimetre um, diameter holes. And I had cardboard tubes in there. When the tubes were filled, I would take them out and then take them into the lab and rear the bees in the lab. Now my first um, project was to look at what method was most effective to survey native bees. Um, so there's a range of methods for surveying native bees in the literature, and so I did lots of reading before I even started my, my project, and there seemed to be like no consensus about which method was best. And um, lots of studies, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, they just put out bee balls or vein traps. I was like, oh, that could be a really cost-saving thing. Maybe I'll do that. But then I was like, oh, no, I'm going to go out and catch bees. That's fun. <laughs> but also, um, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely a method that people use as well. So I decided to do that as well as observational, so counting how many bees there were. And, you know, there's, there's variations on the theme. I didn't use that variation. Um, but um, so, and then... There's the, the sort of difference between the active methods, going out and sweep netting, and observing bees, and then the passive, which are the bee bowls and the vein traps. So which method you use would be really important because if you've got different assemblages or um, one catches a lot less bees, your entire conclusions that you draw could be completely incorrect. So um, it also could be habitat dependent. So that's why I um, decided to test these different methods. And they can also vary by different bees. So in terms of abundance, I found that observations, so how many bees I saw, um, outnumbered all the other methods. Um, but, um, oh, and this is a key thing. So this is how many honeybees I observed, um, and this is how many we collected. So you can see only a tiny proportion of the honeybees that I observed were collected in the, the bee bowls. I didn't actively ca catch honeybees. But this means that if a study used um, just passive methods to get an index of honeybee ab abundance and therefore honeybee competition, it would get a very um, underrepresentative idea of how much honeybee competition there was in the environment. Um, so with native bees, um, Again, I observed more. Um, now, with the passive traps, um, you know, the, all those bee balls and the bay traps only collected 391, whereas I uh, collected over 1,000 with netting. Mm -hmm. And um, these include you know, the bay traps that were up for a month. So clearly, passive methods are insufficient. Um, now, even though observational was better than the other methods, um, you can't ID bees to species level just by looking at them, unless it's like a really obvious bee, like me mega chili orophons with red eyes. But with the tiny, like little uroglossines signs that are under a centimeter long, um, trying to ID them just by looking at them is mm -hmm. literally impossible. Um, so, with abundance, I found sweet caught way more bees, 
blue veins were much better than yellow veins. Uh, yellow pan traps were slightly better than the blue pan traps, but you can see that target squid netting was a lot better. Um, now, in terms of um, species, and I say taxonomic units here because I separated males and females because sometimes um, with many of our native bees, there's a bit of uncertainty about whether um, species that have been described ages ago, whether the male is a separate species from a, a female that's been described as a separate species. So use taxonomic units. Um, and you can see, again, um, target sweet netting was way better than all the others. Blue vein traps were better. In terms of genera, again, and you can see the, the pan traps were very, very um, inappropriate mm. for sampling native bees. Um, and in terms of how many were caught exclusively, so this means that they were only caught by that method, you can see target sweat netting, the majority were then no bees were exclusive to um, the bee bowls at all. So that was um, really interesting. Now with the bee hotels, um, I found that um, even though I caught 34, um, this is, by the way, these results are just on my first year of study. So I actually caught more in total, but 34 cavity and sting make pilots are caught, but only 10 of these actually use the bee hotel. So this means that not all bees, if you put bee hotels out, not all of them will use them. Um, same with the high lanes, and the species composition vastly different. So, um, the main bee to use my bee hotels was Megachili erythropyga. I hardly saw these foraging, but they were very abundant in my bee hotels. Mm. Same with Megachili um, fabricata, and um, yeah, like Megachili oropronz, the proportion of representation in the um, bee, ho bee hotels was very different to what I saw in the field. Now, how does this compare with the literature? I did a bit of a literature review, um, and I looked at 57 studies that compared different methods, and there was heaps of variation. But generally, again, sweet netting actually turned out to also be most effective. So it's strange that despite um, this, people still use passive methods um, exclusively. Um, they might published studies where all they do is just put out blue vein traps, which is really, really wrong. And I've actually got a study that's um, a, a, like a forum piece, a critique of um, this that has been accepted in Austral Ecology and it should be out quite soon. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. Um, so overall, after all that, which method is best? Well, you never catch all bees um, because sometimes the vegetation is, um, inappropriate for catching bees, they're too high, um, so you do need to observe things, but you can never ID to species level by observations or photography even. Um, the main thing is you can't just rely on passive methods because you get a highly biased subset and the, the bees that do um, tend to get in the bee bowls or vein traps are generalists. So I hardly had any of the urogloss which are actually our most species rich subfamily, they were just they didn't go in those at all. So um, very biased um, if you're just using the passive methods. But it's best to employ a range um, of methods. Um, blue vein traps are really good for catching armigella. Um, sweet netting is essential though. Also if you want to do um, pollination network studies, so anything um, associating bees with host plants. Um, the cavities that sweet netting does require are a lot of skill, um, good eyes, good reflexes, um, but it's, it's quite fun as well. <laughs> it's the only way to catch mating uh, pairs with a net. We're not going to go into a uh, bone trap. No. <laughs> yeah, so um, associating males and females is also, um, you need to, to observe that as well. Now, my second chapter, um, the main thing to come out of that was that you cannot replace urban bushland with residential gardens. Um, there's this idea that um, it's okay to clear bush because if we put houses in with heaps of flowers, um, it's, it's an adequate replacement. Well, it's definitely not. Um, now, interestingly, I also, I looked at um, various variables that might influence native bees in residential gardens and in bushlands, such as the number of flower species and um, the number of flowers. 
Now, what was really quite shocking at first was I found that the total number of plant species had a negative effect on the number of native bees and the number of native bee species. And this sort of goes against common sense, like mm. more flower species should mean more bees. But um, when I looked at this closer, it actually made sense because I found that the proportion of native flowers and the proportion of native flower species had a positive effect on native bees. And so when you're in a, like a garden, someone's residential garden, they have lots of different flower species, but most of these are inappropriate for our native bees, and most of our native bees are specialised, so most of the flower species in a garden are um, unsuitable for native bees, and it's like if you're super fussy like me and you go to a store and it's got like heaps and heaps of different things, and I have to try and find like the, the one food that I like. Um, it's much harder, um, so they just avoid that. Um, then the honeybees, though, they did better in gardens that had more flowers. Um, and yeah, the, the bushland remnants, they had more bees, more flower, more bee species, more rare species, and more habitat specific species. So the, the key take home message is that we have to conserve our bushland remnants in urban areas. And unfortunately, they're, they're still continuing to, continuing to be cleared, as I'm sure many of you know and are actively fighting against, so we need to keep up that fight. Now, um, I next looked at pollination networks. So this is looking at bee plant interactions and the structure of these interactions, and it involves like some fancy <laughs> statistics. Um, so the key thing I found here was that extinction slopes were high for bushland remnants, as well as robustness and nestedness. And these, these are statistical properties, so don't worry if you don't really um, understand them. But what it means is that the, the bushland um, remnant pollination networks, they were healthier, um, but if they were just to be disrupted, there would be more cascading extinctions compared with those in residential gardens. Niche overlap, so this is how much bee tax are overlap. That was high in the residential gardens, which mean, means that despite being more flower species, there was higher competition for resources. And again, this is back to lots of inappropriate resources. When I looked at the prop species level properties, they didn't differ between habitats, except for normalized degree, which means how many species were visited, which was high in bushland remnants. And again, this is despite fewer plant species as a whole being there, but it means that more were visited. Again, reinforcing how bushland rem remnants were important. Okay, lots of graphs here, because there was lots of analyses. Um, but I looked at um, the network roles of different bee tax of the native bees and the honeybees in um, the pollination networks, and there are consistent differences between bee tax, in indicating that they had different roles in pollination networks. Now, honey honeybees always almost stood out as being different. They had high normalized degrees, so they visited more species. They're, they're super generalists. They had high species strength, high interaction push pull. So these are, these are all properties, but it basically meant that they had um, broader, um, broader foraging preferences, they weren't that specific on what they foraged on, um, they were less reliant on the plants compared to um, the native bees. And they also influenced network structure. So the more honeybees there were, they had influences on the whole entire pollination network. And they weren't that good influences. So I found that um, when there were more honeybees, the pollination networks were less stable. There was more functional complementarity, um, which suggests that the native bees were partitioning resources more to avoid competition. Um, they were less specialised, the, the whole entire network. And there was also more niche overlap. Again, another sign that honeybees were causing competition. So now to the question, are they competing with the native bees? So the honeybees that introduced the super abundant, large body, very efficient foragers, our native bees, lots of them are smaller, they're solitary so they can't communicate the good locations of flowers, many specialized. Could it be that honeybees are causing competition, causing native bees to die? Mm. So I found that it wasn't, um, at least on my two years of study on this, it wasn't a clear-cut answer. I found that overall, um, honeybees didn't have 
any influence with abundance, but there's actually a positive association in residential gardens. This doesn't mean that honeybees are positively influencing native bees, but it means that the, in residential gardens, the same things that are better for honeybees are also better for native bees. Now, for species richness, I found different results. Um, I found a um, positive association in year one, but a negative association in year two, which um, indicates that competition is dynamic. So this can be expected because competition is influenced by the number of resources in the environment, how much nature overlap there is, different abundances, um, disease, uh, other factors that alter the abundance of native bees and honeybees. But it does show that under some conditions, honeybees can have a negative impact. Now, this, this broad brush approach, um, you also need to look at how honeybees impact native bees with different traits. So I found that honeybee impact varied according to body size. The smaller native bees, they have lower resource requirements. They're actually positively associated with the honeybees. But with the larger body bees, these larger bees, they have higher resource requirements and they were negatively associated. So this all makes like ecological sense. Um, I looked at how competition varied over the, um, the day, um, and I found that there were negative associations in the morning, they were non-significant in the afternoon. Now this could be competition, but it also um, could just mean that honeybees, they're in larger body and their, their origin is temperate, so maybe they're just um, better able to forage in the morning than many of our native bees. And now I looked at nature overlap, so how much the honeybees overlap with the native bees and what they forage on, um, and how this influenced the native bee abundance. And I found that when there was higher resource overlap with honeybees, there were fewer native bees, and that resource overlap was higher in residential gardens. Again, I'm reinforcing the, um, the network approach that I did. Um, I looked at how it varied by bee taxa, and I found that um, resource overlap was highest for the highlands. So these are the taxa that might be most vulnerable to honeybee competition. Um, and it was lower for the amygdala. Now these are, these are general species as well, so it makes sense. But also the megachili. And this is because lots of megachili, they love the native peas. Honeybees don't like native peas very much. And I think it's because of the kill structure. It's just too much effort for them. Um, but yeah, native bees love the native peas. So these are a really good one to plant if you want to help boost the native bees and not um, promote the honeybees. So overall, I found residential gardens, they can't replace remnant bushland habitat for our native bees. The pollination networks were also different, bet different between these habitat types. And in the bushlands, they were more robust, but they're also vulnerable to disruption. Um, honeybees were relatively unaffected by habitat type. They influenced the network structure and they occupy distinct positions compared with our native bees. I found that more flowers actually doesn't mean more bees um, and can exacerbate competition with honeybees. Um, and these are the more flowers overall, but native flowers definitely better. And the effect of native bees assemblage is nuanced. Um, so quite a bit of variation, but they're also not completely benign. Now, throughout my PhD, I you know, that was my thesis, but I had many other exciting things I discovered. Um, I um, found that Pylase nubulosis was now established in Western Australia, and um, it was using my bee hotels, and that's been published in Australian Entomologist, and it's got some beautiful photos by Kerry, so um, I definitely encourage you to check that out. I um, found that many of the bee hotels supplied by Bunnings were absolutely useless, <laughs> and um, they were being inhabited by things like fence skinks, which um, was great for the skinks, but not really if you want to encourage bees. Um, I made some discoveries about parasitism um, with some mites, some Pyomotes mites and a mega chili, as well as um, a bomb village that was parasitizing um, mega chili fabricata in my bee hotels. This was in Shenton Park, so Shenton Park was a really cool place. Made lots of discoveries there. Um, that's also going to be cleared, unfortunately. Um, I made some cool observations of Mary Glosser, including 
um, pulling naked chili bees out from bee hotels, so mm. in competition there. Um, and like my most exciting discovery, I think, was how um, it's now being reclassified Rosenapis, but when I published this, it was Mega Chili Igniter. It's now being classified into its, a gene of all of its own. Mm -hmm. um, and it uses Banksia fuzz in its nests. And I don't know why, um, but it does. And um, this is a really, a really cool bee. Um, I found um, Euroglossine and Papacilla nesting in tiny holes in Banksia, reinforcing how we have to preserve um, Banksias around urban areas. Mm. Um, I discovered that um, Hylaeus rufusets come Monday, it was nesting in polystyrene insulation. And these are usually solitary bees, but there were literally hundreds nesting in polystyrene insulation in someone's house. Mm. Um, so he wasn't too happy about that, but I thought it was really cool. Um, <laughs> and um, I, thanks to citizen science, um, I was when I made the, the finding that a introduced species from Af originally from Africa was now in Western Australia. It was known to be in Australia, um, but it um, was discovered in 2000 in Queensland, all the way down the east coast. But thought that you know the um, the continent um, was a barrier, but it's now turned up here. And just recently, <coughs> someone else on my Bees in the Burbs Facebook um, group. Um, sent a photo to me and it was this bee and it was now in Bunbury. So clearly can get around quite a bit. So keep your eye out for this. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got lots more um, papers that are half finished or under review. So um, if you want to keep up to date on my, my bee research, um, that's my Twitter handle and Bees in the Burbs Facebook group is where um, I post lots of my stuff. So that's my Facebook group. Um, it's now got over 8,000 people. It's a job in itself, an unpaid job, but um, every day, yeah, I'm IDing photos of bees, or a couple of months ago it was lots of surfer flies. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, there can be some interesting discussions on there, let's just say. Um, but yeah, if you have any photos of native bees, um, as I mentioned, it's impossible to ID to species level in most cases, but I can ID to genus. Um, and if you have any questions about native bees, and I share lots of like memes and other and things like that on there. Um, now, I also wrote a little book, um, because you know, thesis isn't enough. Um, <laughs> it's a good, good pro procrastination project. Um, on um, bee hotel designs and the plant, the flower plants that our native bees need, because there's lots of people that want to help the native bees, but the information isn't readily, readily available out there, and there's so much misinformation out there, and poorly made bee hotels um, that can do more harm than good. And um, as I mentioned, like one of the findings of my research was that um, gardens full of flowers aren't necessarily a good thing. They're the wrong kind of flower. So I've got. Um, the, the book called Creating a Haven for Native Bees and it's got that information in there and I've got a, a couple here today if anyone would like some. Um, so another little like detour from my thesis was I also went up to Carnarvon to study Amagilla dorsoni with Professor Steve Boochman. I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing his last name wrong but um, <laughs> it was an amazing experience and um, he was from Arizona he came with his partner Kay and it was so great to spend a few days with an, um, another bee expert and um, study Amygdala dorsoni, which is probably my favorite native bee. Um, they've got some amazing like behaviors and um, yeah, it was, it was really exciting. So um, I also designed a couple <coughs> of murals to raise awareness about native, native bees because throughout my, my thesis, I just became aware of how much um, native bees aren't even recognized and, and people still think that native bees are feral honeybees, which is a, a big problem. So I've been really working hard to try and raise the profile of our native bees um, as well as the flowers they need. So I've got some little murals of someone stuck for like Christmas gifts. Um, <laughs> there, um, those murals and a couple of other designs are on various things. 
Um, and they're even on face masks because they're so fashionable at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I made some bingo cards for like the, the common bees for people to go out bee spotting because like it's so fun going out and finding bees and they're just like their behaviours are really fascinating and they're great um, subjects if you want to have a challenging subject for photography and if anyone wants to see great native bee photos, Kerry is your person. <laughs> she's, she posts a lot of native, um, her native bee photos on bees and the verbs and she's a very valuable member so a big shout out to Kerry. Um, yeah so if you um, are interested I love doing native bee surveys and um, especially in our patches of, of remnant bushland because they're so precious and so much has been um, understudied in the urban areas I think it's really important to um, identify what native bees are here so that they don't get lost to um, residential development. So recently I've been doing surveys for the city of Kalamunda and city of Bayswater and Friends of Lake Claremont, which has been um, really, really good. And I'm still finding um, species that I haven't found before, which is amazing. Like I think by now I would have recorded over 200 species just in the, the Perth metro area. Um, I also do um, presentations to schools and community groups and like this group um, on native bees in general and how we can help them and um, yeah uh, I can also help if you're interested in designing your garden so it can be suitable habitat for our native bees. So thank you everyone for um, mm -hmm. listening to my, my presentation and my thesis. I know it's quite like a heavy you know, science-y thesis, um, but yeah, it's really um, lovely to have people interested in what I've been doing with my life for the last four years. So thank you. <laughs>